Greetings, beaky enthusiasts! It's time for another one of those videos where I take a very old 40k model and get it back on the tabletop in the current edition. Today I'll be restoring a personal favourite model of mine, a Rogue Trader Dreadnought, originally released in 1987. Unfortunately, this Dreadnought in particular is in a bit of a sorry state, limping, missing a base and an arm, and with a few small customizations from its previous owner that need to be removed. But at least it's already been mostly stripped of paint, and due to its condition I got it pretty cheap on eBay. For those interested, this is the wider body variant, and it has the shorter legs because Stumpy was just an option you could have for some reason. Speaking of the legs, although I assume he was in this kind of pose originally, the arm positioning does kind of make it look like he was supposed to be kicking down a door. But anyway, before I do anything, into the punishment drawer he goes. Okay, I'm not just being weird. If a model was put together with super glue, then putting them in the freezer will weaken the bonds and allow you to more easily disassemble them. Now I can tidy up the pieces, filing away any solid glue that's left, and start reassembling it in a slightly more sensible pose. Now, there's three issues that I have with getting this prepared for use in 8th edition. It's bolter, it's missing arm, and it's height. The bolter is an issue since this came with one of the single bolter arms rather than the double ones that can easily count as a storm bolter. Fortunately, since I'll be running this in my Blood Angels army, then a regular dreadnought can take a melter gun instead, so I painstakingly filed away the magazine, chopped off the barrel, and used parts from a spare Infernus pistol to make it into a melter gun. And I think it looks pretty good considering that the original gun is pretty wonky anyway. At this point, I also added a purity seal and pinned the foot so it could be firmly attached to the base, since large metal models can never be trusted not to destroy themselves and everything around them. As for the other arm, well, the only part it came with was this bit that looks like it came from some other non-Games Workshop model kit. Honestly, I have no idea where it came from. Let me know in the comments if for some reason you happen to. However, since this arm just needs to be a heavy weapon, I do have a solution. I just so happen to have an era-appropriate plasma cannon spare that will do the job nicely. The original Dreadnoughts never came with a plasma cannon to my knowledge, but they can use one nowadays, so I'm just going to go for it. I also used a little bit of guitar string to feed a cable from the back of the Dread to the weapon, just because I thought it would help tie those two bits together more. Now for an all-important step, very important, applying a blood drop to his head. These are actually some nail art supplies that Snipe found for me. Seriously, these things are incredibly useful if you can find one that's the right shape for whatever army you're making. The little stars have been hugely helpful in my fledgling Grot Rebellion army anyway. Now we can look at the height issue, and yeah, he's a bit of a tiny lad. So how do we deal with this? Well, I'm going to build up the base so he ends up roughly the same height as a modern Dread. Fortunately, I have a stack of dice spare from buying issue 1 of Mortal Realms, and they're pretty much exactly the right size. This is also one of the reasons why I'm using a modern 60mm round base rather than one of the old 40mm square ones it would have originally came on. There just wouldn't have been the space to do this on the smaller one. So, with the dice glued in place, I'm ready to start building up the base. You could use green stuff or modelling putty here, but what I'm actually using is some all-purpose filler. This is because A, it's very cheap, B, it hardens a lot quicker, and C, I just wanted to see how well it worked. It's also a pain to get out of the tube. So much squeezing later, and here we are. It's always going to look a little weird since it's effectively just a booster seat for him, so the rocks and skulls were added to make it look a little bit more natural. However, here's where I hit a problem. So, whilst I was doing this build, I was also rebasing my other Rogue Trader Dread, and used some of the same filler on the base. The filler takes paint just fine, but I discovered that it crumbles away if you use any of those cracking texture paints from GW, which I do on the army that this is for. So for this Dreadnought, I ended up covering the whole thing in a thin layer of green stuff just to protect it. Well, what I actually did was I first covered it in a layer of PVA glue since it reacted really badly to the green stuff initially. Basically, the filler technique works okay provided you don't want to do the exact thing that I'm doing with it. Oh, I also used this opportunity to add the skull that came with this model to the base since I forgot to do that earlier. But with that done, it is finally time to prime. The base was sprayed with Chaos Black and the Dread itself with Lead Belcher. They were then glued together since I didn't want to be handling the chunky metal model itself too much whilst I was painting. Painting the base was pretty simple, I just went over it with Martian Iron Earth and then dry brushed it with Ushabti Bone, picking out the rim of the base in black and then painting the skulls. On the Dread itself, the first step was to block out all the colours. I won't go through every single bit of the painting process, but the main parts are the bone bits are based in Bane Blade Brown and the bronze parts are Warp Block Bronze. I then built up the bone with repeated coats of Ushabti Bone until I had a finish that I was happy with. Then I go over the whole thing with washers, filling in the recesses with Nuln Oil on the metals and Agrax Earthshade on the bone. 
And as a side note, I'm always a little amazed by how much a simple wash can make a model pop. At this point, I also added in some of the little details like the iconography, the purity seal, and the eye lenses. Next up was edge highlighting and adding chips and scratches to the whole thing. The scratches were done with Abaddon Black on the metallics and Bane Blade Brown on the bone. On the deeper scratches, I add a little bit of Lead Belcher and Rune Fang Steel to make it look like it's gone through the paint and the undercoat all the way to the metal. So there we are, one Rogue Trader Dreadnought in all its glory ready for use in 8th edition. With its bigger base and increased height, it's now up to the size of my other Dread from this era, and pretty much equal to a modern Dread too. The paintwork is a little iffy in places, although that's largely because, as much as I love them, these sculpts are pretty rough compared to what we know now, with symmetry often being an alien concept and the surfaces being uneven and difficult to tidy up at the best of times. Also, I kind of wish that I'd used a more bulky bit of cabling at the back, just because it looks a little thin compared to the chunky style of the rest of the model. But overall, I'm content with how it came out, and it fits in just fine with my other marines, both new and old. Plus, it's just nice to have one of these with a 100% legal weapon loadout now, unlike the one that I run as a Furioso. Also, just so you know, it has already seen some action on the tabletop, punching a Carnifex to death. So that's pretty fun. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'd like to do some more like this in the future. Hopefully I can set up a better work area, since it's quite difficult to film stuff how I currently do it. But that's something to plan later. For now, I shall return to my plans to build a functional time machine, so I can go back in time and buy like 20 of these dreads at £3.50 each. It just feels like the best use of the technology, you know?